it is really honor for me to to have this presentation for you, and thanks for the opportunity to share uh, our results uh, and some other information about the related um, medicine. So um, I will show you a little bit uh, what we are doing in Gdansk, uh, in Poland, in our lab. Also some general information uh, concerning the uh, observation and um, um, some about also stem cells. So, um, yeah, thanks for the line. Um, few words, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the tissue engineering, so just to introduce a few words. Uh, uh, is relatively new branch of science based on biotechnology, molecular biology, nanotechnology, and related science. Um, it includes uh, three main elements, cells, scaffold, and growth factor. So it's, in my opinion, it's really fascinating field of science because John, many fields of science when we cooperate with the chemists, uh, with the uh, molecular biologists, the clinicians, physicians. So it's really, really um, interesting and I think also inspiring uh, field of science. So we do believe that the tissue engineering constitutes the basis of regenerative uh, and also personal medicine today. So it's a uh, it's fantastic story in my opinion. So uh, when we call, when we say about tissue engineering, usually we say that this is based on the triad. So there are three main elements of, of the tissue engineering. So it's cells, of course, uh, I will show you a little later about cells, uh, biomaterials, so which normally they form as a, scaffold, the support, and of course, sigma. So you need to keep in mind that uh, cells, we, when we transplant the cells with the patient, when we do anything with the cells, the cells without signals, without growth factor, for example, peptides, they, they're not alive. I mean, they, they will go undergo apoptosis, for example. So they need to have a support, not only mechanical support, uh, but also the signals from the microenvironment to, to stimulate the cells. And it concerns uh, not only the vitro cells when you culture the cells, but also concern when you transplant cells to the, for example, wound bed, when we need to have a growth factors to stimulate regeneration process. So, um, so we can use different kinds of cells that can be autologous from the same patient. Uh, very often, uh, plastic surgery, they do that, sometimes hematologists. Um, when we culture cells, um, for example, for the patient, this is sometimes also autologous. Then we have allogenic, so different uh, donor, and sometimes there are cell line, like for example, tra transform cell line. So I'm not uh, tell the details because we, because we don't have enough time for that, but generally transform cell line are very often used um, also in the United States, uh, but we still have some safety concern about the oncological thing. So, uh, we must, we must uh, keep in mind that uh, yeah, we should um, uh, look ab about it. So biomaterials, different biomaterials, I will tell you a few words about that also today. And regulatory signals, mainly growth factors, um, cytokines, but also peptides. So small peptides, uh, we can also synthesize uh, in the laboratory. So we can also um, use a growth factor as a platform and then let's say, cut the fragment, which is very interesting, or which is active, and then we can synthesize the peptide and then stimulate cells to, um, to uh, proliferation, differentiation. So we're thinking about it not only in vitro, so we're looking for appropriate microenvironment in vitro to stimulate cells, but of course we're thinking about the in vivo transplantation. So if we would like to transplant something uh, to this patient, we need to have appropriate support. So the principal thing is, of course, angiogenesis and vascularization. So surgeries, um, they always um, tell us that we, when we think about transplantation, we need to transplant this tissue to appropriate uh, bed, the appropriate microenvironment, because if there are no vessels, for example, uh, it, it, it will not work, actually. So uh, so that's the that's the point. So a different strategy. You can see that uh, we can use the let's say scaffold, different scaffolds. Uh, sometimes with the surface modification, there's a huge, really huge uh, area of that. Then we can uh, bind these um, scaffolds with the peptide the growth factors. We also do that uh, with the cooperation with the chemists. Um, there are sometimes uh, very crucial peptides and growth factors, depending what we would like to do, what we would like to have. So, so 
let's say BMP, PDGF, uh, EGF, this is growth factors which are crucial for regeneration. So you can you can bind them um, to the scaffold and then then uh, use the scaffold as a as a biomaterial. And of course, stem cells, which are advanced therapy medicinal product, um, it's much more expensive. But also we're thinking about it. Uh, maybe also with the cooperation with Professor Serena uh, in the future. Um, this is much more advanced, but uh, yeah, we have a little bit also experience with um, with um, with cells. So the idea is that we have a patient, uh, let's say from with disease, we take the fragment of uh, of tissue that can be, for example, fat tissue. Um, for example, with the stem cells, we culture them, expand them. Sometimes we, we can modify them genetically. Sometimes we can differentiate them to, for example, chondrocytes, and then bind with biomaterials and then transplant. So we reintroduce cells into the patient. So this is this is one of the strategy. Um, for example, cartilage. So talking about cartilage, one of the most important, crucial challenge now is how to transplant this chondrocyte and the fragment of cartilage and uh, with, with appropriate place, with appropriate microenvironment, oxygen, nutrient, everything. Because in most of the cases, when we look at the effects of the transplantation of fragments of joints, for example, the cartilage, um, after a few weeks, uh, some of the cells dying actually. So uh, this is a challenge for sure, how to prepare the cartilage that can be transplanted and then we will be alive for for uh, for a weeks or a month. Okay, so so um, this is the, mm, for sure the challenge. So sometimes you can we can you can also use nanobiomaterials uh, to do that to stimulate, for example, differentiation of cells. So this is also the idea which uh, is now really developed. So talking about stem cells, which are crucial in the regeneration, but also in the regenerative therapies. We have actually three main uh, origins. So embryonic stem cells, which I will not uh, talk uh, because as you know they are ethical and the low um, concern dependent on, on the country. We have induced pluripotent stem cells. I will tell them about them just a uh, few slides. And adult stem cells, uh, especially I will talk today about mesenchymal stem cells derived from the fat tissue. So, um, as you know, there was a Nobel Prize for uh, Professor Shinya Yamanaka, 2012. Uh, I'm sure you heard about it. Uh, so he, uh, using transcriptional factors, he changed the differentiated cells to the pluripotent stem cells. And then when we have this pluripotent stem cell, then we can, you can culture them, you can expand them, and then you can uh, theoretically differentiate them to different cells. Uh, that you that you need. So also I had the opportunity to to culture them um, at Oxford University in 2015. Uh, we were trying to um, force them to produce beta cells. Uh, so thinking about the uh, insulin production, uh, thinking about diabetes. So that could be a kind of personal medicine that you take the fragment of the skin or from the fat tissue. Then you obtain the pluripotent stem cells, and then you obtain beta cells that will produce insulin. So that's the, the idea. That there was a, there's still lots of challenges. This is not, of course, the idea that's so simple. Um, but I do believe that uh, maybe that will be the uh, one of the strategies that it is one, because as you know, this is still uh, a huge, huge challenge um, for the medicine, especially because when you look at, at the statistics. It's really still increasing the number of the, of the patients, young patients in our hospital. We have a patient six, seven, eight uh, years old, and uh, it's really growing. So when I was talking with, speaking with uh, our physician, so let's say 20, 25 years ago, there was maybe one or maybe two children in, in one month with diabetes one diagnosed. Now uh, we have one or two a day. So it's really dramatically increasing uh, and nobody actually know what is the, the principal cause. I mean, we know that's an environment, chemical, everything, but generally it's, uh, it's something that they study actually. Of course, genetic background, but uh, yeah, I think uh, genetic background do not explain actually this huge increase in the number, but just uh, 
Um, okay, so uh, these pluripotent stem cells you can differentiate with the different cells. This, this is not my word. This is uh, Yamanaka, of course, uh, and uh, it's quite easy to differentiate with the cardiomyocyte. So thinking about the regeneration of the heart, so uh, uh, it's, it's uh, something which is really interesting to me. So when I met uh, Professor Serena, I was mainly interested in the regeneration of, of cardiac cells in the heart. So uh, maybe we'll continue this um, this topic. Uh, so of course uh, there is lots of challenges and problems because one thing is to produce something, even the tissue, which as you as you can see is a little similar to the cardiomyosis, but the, the challenge is how to transplant and introduce the heart and synchronize the beating. So this is actually crucial and this is still a challenge. So um, I know that there, there is uh, uh, lots of uh, clinical trials connected with that. I'm not familiar with that, so I'm not going to tell you the details, but generally this is the, the one of the ideas. So other steps. So when you look at the, our organism, you see that different uh, organs, different tissue, possess different regenerative capabilities. And these capabilities mainly depend on the number of stem cells. So as you probably know, we have a bone marrow when, when, when we have the hematopoietic stem cell, and the regeneration of bone marrow, bone marrow is very high. The same skin, the turnover of the skin in the epidermis about 30 days. Uh, in the gut, we have also lots of uh, stem cells. The turnover is a few days. So it's quite easy to obtain the cells from this tissue and culture them in vitro. But when you look at the, let's say, kidney, lung, uh, brain, heart, it's not so easy because the number of stem cells is really, really low. So this is uh, just a short overview of how it looks uh, um, in our organs. And of course, niches, a few words about the niches. So we are very interested in the niches. So the niches are like, like, they are like a home for cells. So with very specific microenvironment. So we are interested in, that in the microenvironment because we are trying to mimic this microenvironment in vitro. Okay, so it's like uh, you know when you know what cells like in home, we try sometimes to mimic that in vitro in the lab because you you need to keep in mind that when you take the cells from the niches from the organs to the lab it's really huge stress for them. So lots of thinking, lots of uh, metabolic um, changes you observe, and sometimes some, some of them are not uh, good for us, thinking about, let's say, therapy, thinking about the differentiation and so on. So um, we collaborate with the clinicians, mainly with the Department of Surgery and Plastic Surgery, so we obtain the, um, the, the main the pet tissue, but also skin. So um, in most of the cases, this is the, like a waste uh, after the surgery. Sometimes uh, we have lots of this um, fat tissue. So normally it was treated as a waste. And now we can use that uh, for, the, for, the, for the research. Uh, the same plastic surgery. The plastic surgery, we have mainly um, liposuction. So this is also very good um, um, it's a material for us. Um, also, uh, when you have a fat tissue, in the lab, it is also possible to isolate very small vessels. So we have now um, um, optimized some protocols from the isolation of endothelial cells. So this is primary endothelial cells. I think it's really great uh, material to to work with. I know that most of the people work with the cell line, with the FUVEC, with different uh, cells. But uh, yeah, I think it's it could be a good model. Now we try and um, analyze now some angiogenetic factors and we try to analyze how they work uh, work in vitro um, so this is something which is um, for sure the next project which we will try to um, develop and try to use for example uh, yeah, migration or capillary formation uh, in vitro so this is the um, a few words about the technique of isolation uh, the fragmentation uh, washing uh, and the crucial um, step is enzyme because uh, mesenchymal stem cells in the bone marrow and in the fat tissue they are fixed to the uh, to the matrix. Okay, so when you want to isolate them, you need to use the uh, enzyme, different en enzymes, mainly collagenase to cut the fragments, and and then you obtain stromal vascular fraction. Yeah, we need to remember that there there is an, uh, there are different cells there. Not only stem cells, not only the stem cells, but also, for example, lymphocytes. 
So we need to remember that when we're thinking about allo transplantation. Okay, because uh, mesenchymal stem cells, we say that they are immunoprivileged cells. So generally, it is theoretically possible to transplant be between the patients, but uh, yeah, there's still concern about it. But if you have a stromobuscular fraction with the lymphocyte, for example, so it is um, more complicated. Then you culture them, you expand them uh, in vitro. This is the holography um, microscopy. Uh, which show us very nicely how the cells behave uh, and uh, and how the cells proliferate in vitro. Uh, very good thing is about this uh, stem cell that they proliferate very nice. And what is crucial in our hand and in our lab when we see in the cells, we don't see actually age dependent effect. I mean, this is very low. So even even if you isolate cells from the elderly people. Um, they behave quite nice and proliferate. They, they differentiate them, different, differentiate the different cells, cell line. Um, when we compare that with, with the skin, keratinocyte and fibroblast, we, ob we do observe really huge differences. So, um, yeah, this is something also like an advantage uh, of this uh, of the cells. So, of course, we make uh, different analyses of the cells, like a full cytometry to confirm that this is really stem cells uh, differentiation potential. So normally they differentiate uh, to chondrocytes, uh, adipocytes, and osteocytes. So a few words about them. Uh, yes, um, very often we call them medis medicinal signaling cells because uh, uh, with this nomenclature is still uh, the nomenclature is still controversial. Some people say that this is adipose derived stem cells, maybe stromal cells, mesenchymal stromal cells, medicinal signaling cells. Uh, so yeah, we still you know. Um, discuss um, about it when we send the manuscript. <laughs> and always the viewer has some, some uh, yeah, suggestion or even very strong suggestion that we should change that. Because, for example, one guy said that this is medicinal signaling cells. So we change everything to medicinal signaling cells because the viewer said that this is absolutely necessary. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the thing. So, uh, what is important? Um, so, they secrete a wide spectrum of growth factors. So they have really huge paracline uh, potential. So, we do believe that if they work uh, after transplantation, they mainly work via different growth factors and the paracline effects. So, this is um, important. They have some uh, immunosuppressive uh, uh, cytokines they produce like interleukin 10, TGF. So uh, that's why we use them now in the clinical trials in the autoimmune diseases, like lupus, like uh, um, rheumatoid arthritis. So the idea is that they stimulate regeneration, but also they, uh, they um, inhibit uh, inflammation. Yeah, and for us, is really important model for in vitro screening and, and potential drugs. So. Um, that's that's we use them. So I'm not going to tell the, the whole details about the effect and the mechanism of action because really lots of things. So they have immunosuppression. They do immunosuppression. They can uh, stimulate nerve repairing, nerve vascularization because PAWG, they have quite high uh, expression of PAWG. Uh, cytokine, uh, yeah, genetic manipulation, differentiation maybe. Uh, in the IPS uh, formation, there are some very nice publications that show us that this cell are very good model and target for gene therapy and production of also induced polypotent stem cells. Um, yeah, and uh, all, always, um, yeah, we're thinking about the oncology. So there are two things. Uh, one thing is that these cells can, uh, we can use theoretically in anti-cancer therapy because these cells possess the ability that they can uh, go to the inflammation sites. So there are some paper very interesting that uh, people, they modify them or they, they put inside oncolytic viruses. And then theoretically, the cells migrate to the tumor and they inhibit the tumor. Okay, So it's also possible to modify the cells and, for example, to conjugate cells with the anti-cancer drug. Okay, and then they can uh, they can um, they can also have this effect. But from another thing, another side, um, when we transplant stem cells, 
we also thinking about oncological safety, especially in the oncological patient. So um, when I have uh, opportunity to be in the um, some big conference uh, clinicians, they uh, they usually ask about the safety. Can they just plan them, for example, a, uh, a woman after mastectomy, for example? Should they wait? Uh, how long they should wait? So they are still concerned about it. And uh, yeah, I think uh, this is this this demands uh, really uh, advanced um, clinical trials because we know that they produce lots of proangiogenic and proregenerative uh, factors. So yes, so so this is something that we need to be uh, need to know. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, immunomodulatory differentiation modeling um, uh, also in the cardiovascular disease. Uh, 3D printing, we also try to use them in the 3D printing. So very, very interesting effects uh, is um, uh, when we have a patient, oncological patient after radiotherapy. As you may know, oncological therapy, chemotherapy, traditional chemotherapy, and radiotherapy cause lots of side effects. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially um, radiotherapy uh, in the skin, so there are some very nice clinical trials that show us that they, that they have um, nice uh, effects so they can block the side effect. For example, they can uh, block, um, um, they can induce a uh, neovascularization. Uh, so uh, this is something that people are interested. Um, in our lab, we try to um, analyze cells, also, um, uh, also stromal vascular fraction, differentiation potential, um, and also, we uh, try to analyze them using single cell uh, sequencing. Um, so um, I, I, I don't uh, not, I don't have this data here because uh, we just analyze them and prepare a manuscript. But generally, this is what we see. But uh, also, few papers uh, confirm that that we have actually when you count your cells, you have actually few population of cells. So it's not so clean. It's not so uh, homogeneous. Uh, so uh, maybe in the future, when we will think about the therapy, maybe we should choose one population, or maybe we should select, or maybe we should sort a uh, population of cells that, for example, they have anti-inflammatory effect. So um, yeah, this is for sure. It's not, it's not so so easy, and it's not so simple. And uh, but I think it's really really interesting um, um, when 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 you see this population. Also, uh, in, in, in our lab, we try to analyze and compare fibroblasts from the skin, from the same patient, with this adiposterized stem cells. So the origin of the cells is, is quite similar, but when you look uh, at the level of transcriptional and sequencing RNA, we, we do see uh, lots, of, uh, lots of differences. Okay, so lots of, uh, yes, uh, clinical trials uh, um, concerning digestive system, gastrointestinal, vascular disease, joint disease, of course, and of course, wounds and injuries. So one of the things that we also analyze is comparing with oncological patients and plastic surgery patients, because oncological patients, uh, I'm thinking about in situ cancer, for example, um, this, these patients are very often, they require reconstructive. And the question is, can we use their fat tissue and build something, create on the, on the tissue organ and then transplant them. So um, this is one of our study that we compare resonative potential and the um, uh, transcriptional profile of cells from the plastic surgery and the oncological surgery. And we, we haven't seen any, uh, any, any differences. Also, when you compare the flow cytometry um, uh, markers, also when you look at the differentiation potential, also there was no, um, there was no um, differences. This is also the picture of this uh, differentiation. So yeah, they, they, they differentiate quite nice. Of course, when you stimulate you know, uh, the cell, appropriate growth factors, appropriate um, chemicals. Okay, so this is what we also do is we analyze these cells after stimulation. For example, we can stimulate peptides, growth factors, and then analyze what's happening with them. Uh, so just to overview that uh, uh, we analyzed transcript and uh, one of our peptides, which was based on PDGF, 
um, uh, very nice um, stimulate um, cell side pro progression and all intracellular pathways responsible for um, proliferation. Okay, this is also uh, this is unpublished data, but uh, I wanted to um, also show you that this is also we do we, what we see that stem cells from the fact that they are very resistant to different factors like a chemical, like a, like a cytotoxic um, drugs. Uh, this uh, campotitin, this is one of the chemotherapeutic uh, agent. And also this is quite sim simple uh, analysis, but uh, show us that they are, they are very resistant to apoptosis. So um, this is something uh, also crucial when we think about the therapy, about the transplantation. So for sure, we will uh, do the next uh, study concerning that. A few words about skin. So um, also we obtain the skin from the patients. Uh, we isolate cells. We can make some scratch tests, uh, for example, to analyze peptides, growth factors. Uh, we can also create the epidermis that potentially could uh, be transplanted to the patient. Uh, but of course, uh, this epidermis is very fragile, so it's very delicate. So um, yeah, we need to have a supportive for that, so like a biomaterial. Also, uh, we culture explants. Explants are very nice when you would like to analyze the compounds and the chemicals and the drugs. So this is also that we can uh, that we can do. A few words about the age-related effect. So, as I mentioned before, when you culture cells from the elderly people, um, uh, cells behave different. So, we still need to have appropriate factors, appropriate signals to stimulate cells uh, from the elderly people. Because these people uh, very often demand they need to have this kind of treatment. So, this is, this is a challenge for us. One of the reasons is that uh, normally in vivo in patient, stem cells undergo asymmetric division. Okay, so we have stem cells, then we have another stem cells, and the second is we call the transit amplifying cell. So this is partially differentiated cells. Okay, so the idea, let's say of the nature, was that the number of stem cells is still the same. Okay, but in vitro, when you look at the differentiation and, and proliferation. So you will see that uh, most of these cells, they go and their commitment and differentiate. So the number of stem cells in vitro, they're dropping down, they're decreasing. So that's why you don't see uh, the proliferation potential. Uh, so that's one of the um, challenge for us. Just a few words also about another area of our interest is epigenetic regeneration. So we try to uh, analyze and we're looking for epigenetic um, compounds that could modify epigenome to stimulate regeneration. Uh, one of the compounds that we found uh, together with the uh, uh, authors from the Regenova Consortium uh, was Zebularin, is a cytodine analog of DNA, methylotransferase inhibitor. And first, when we look at this inhibitor, we show that uh, in most of the concentration um, we observe inhibition of proliferation uh, of keratinocytes and fibroblasts. Uh, but uh, in some concentration, we, uh, we observe stimulation of proliferation. And what is interesting in the animal models um, using um, the ear model of regeneration, we observe really high uh, regeneration potential. So, this is just a fragment of this of this work, but I would like to emphasize that maybe it could be uh, maybe new strategy of regeneration. So epigenome is my I think it's much more safer um, uh, to implementation, and maybe it could be idea for future properties. A uh, few words about biomaterials. So you see, there's a lot of things that we need to remember when you try to design biomaterials for tissue engineering. Uh, elasticity, degradability, toxicity, motifs that cells recognize, so different things that you need to uh, need to remember that. Um, so the challenges that we have is, uh, of course, safety, surface modification, design of function, efficiency, um, of course, sourcing GMP components. Uh, today I had the opportunity to show, to, to, to observe uh, your GMP lab, that was really great. Uh, 
So uh, this is something um, something crucial. Of course, sterility. It's not so obvious because sometimes chemists they produce biomaterials, but they cannot sterilize them. So there there is a challenge to sterilize because, for example, I don't know temperature change the part or irradiation change something. So this is also something that we need to uh, remember. Uh, yeah, and together with the uh, consortium Regenova, we are looking for new compounds, related compounds, gels. Um, so um, that could be could be um, used in the in the clinic. Um, we also uh, produce some um, more advanced uh, biomaterials that, that will be cutting, for example, um, in the for example wound or and the other microenvironment, and then we'll be re releasing the peptides. Um, PTGF, I, I, I mentioned before that uh, we created a few peptides based on the grow factors, and they work very nice. So they stimulated migration, um, uh, they stimulated a little bit chemotaxis, but in the in, in vivo test also stimulated uh, healing uh, in ear and, and also still skin and, and the animal method. A few words about the transcriptional profiling. Uh, I wanted to show you one thing that we observed and we, are re we were really uh, surprised. So this is patient-to-patient -patient variability. So when you stimulate, for example, uh, one, one, uh, uh, one sample each of the peptide, sometimes you can observe in one patient stimulation, uh, in another, another patient, which is, for example, the same age, sex, and then I don't know, disease, uh, disease background, you can observe completely different intercellular signaling and, and, and the, 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 the response. So this is something uh, that we need to also remember. So this is a challenge for us as a scientist, how we can, uh, how we can analyze the cells and how, how can we show in the manuscript, because there are some different ideas. Some people show each of the patients some of the, the pooling cells from, from few patients. So this is, uh, this is the, the challenge. Some of them, they show lots like here, with the effect for three patients. So this algorithm show you the medium. Okay, but when you see it on, on this patient, you see that one patient responds that and another completely different. So, so um, just to, to um, keep in mind, okay. Uh, I think I have don't have in, uh, too much time, so just just show you some some overview. That's the Pollock summer that is very often used as a biometer as a, as a gel. Um, uh, peptides like immunopan, which also stimulate um, stimulate proliferation. Few words about peptides. Peptides are very interesting because uh, they can be quite easy modified. So we can modify, chemically modify, and they are not so expensive like uh, like a low factor, like a protein. And also, when you look at the uh, global peptide therapeutic market, you see that this is still increasing. So it's huge market will be. Uh, so in my opinion, this is really, uh, really something uh, promising uh, uh, in, uh, in the research, but also maybe especially in the business and the, and the commercial. So what we do, um, we just analyze different um, peptides, also antimicrobial uh, peptides, using immunological tests, using um, cytotoxic tests, uh, and using primary cells, but also transform cell line. So um, yeah, transform cell line, uh, I was asking about it during, during uh, yesterday journal club because uh, they are very nice as a, as a model at the beginning. So it's quite easy to obtain them, quite easy to, to culture them. But then when you would like to check on the primary cell, not often you can observe the same effects. So skin, uh, yeah, regeneration, biomaterials, also we uh, cooperate with chemists. Uh, we analyze hydrogels uh, uh, using different uh, microscopy, analyze cytotoxic using LVH test, for example, or proliferation using the test. Uh, also, we need to remember that one of the challenges in the, the regeneration, uh, especially skin regeneration, is inflammation, is, uh, is bacteria. So we also work with the peptides that have also antimicrobial effects. So this is crucial. This is one of the examples. 
this is the this that you see um, uh, pe uh, peptide, which is based actually on this uh, on this um, uh, protein. So we analyze some uh, early spot uh, also in, uh, 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 effects. For example, uh, TNF alpha, which you know that is pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine. So uh, we check uh, if there is anti-inflammatory effect. Also, interleukin four. 5.13, which, 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 which is imported in the allergic reaction. Okay, so um, also uh, some uh, more advanced tests uh, using PBM cell, PBMC, so we can analyze immunological uh, activity. So you can analyze lymphocytes. So you, uh, you challenge, you stimulate cells in vitro, and then you see how change the markers of the lymphocytes. So then you can observe potential immunogenicity uh, when you use this peptide uh, for the patient. Okay, another examples, um, yeah, this is also PDGF, but also this PDG, in this work, we would join this peptide with the gel. Okay, so that's the idea. So uh, in our uh, work, very often we have a situation that first we have uh, active peptides, that was the first, let's say, manuscript publication. We showed that it works. And then we joined together with the gels, different gels to stimulate, for example, um, uh, cells to proliferate. Also, keep in mind that maybe this biomaterial will be used to the transplantation. So that will be the scaffold for the cells when we think about the transplantation. Okay. Microcellulose also, it's quite nice. Uh, also, some we have some work with uh, with the microcellulose. Um, yeah, very, very interesting test. It's pure word. It's a basophil activation test. So one of the problem, one of the thing is that when you have a peptide or drug, you don't know exactly what is the allergic potential of that, that drug. And sometimes in the clinical trials, you see that quite often we have allergic reactions. So it, it is possible to predict that. Uh, we can use the blood of the patient and we can uh, analyze only basophils. Basophils, as you know, are substitute of mast cells. Normally in the, our tissue are mast cells, which are responsible for the allergic reaction, but in the blood we have basophils, so they can, uh, they are, let's say, substitute of the mast cells. And using different, uh, let's add, two, three markers of activation of the cell, you can uh, predict allergic potential of, of that uh, peptide. So it's quite nice. Okay, chemotherapy, so we're also looking for the biomaterials for the patient after radiotherapy, as I mentioned before, this is one of the things that we do. Uh, some of them, they are based, based on the three peptides, um, which normally occur in the skin, so this is very good platform at beginning when you would like to create the new, uh, new peptides. Um, okay, some, some results of that. Also, uh, we work with the 3D printing, so this is very also nice um, technique. Lots of advantages, like a wide range of applications, high precision, of course, relatively low cost. But of course, there are some challenges, like uh, problems with vascularization. As I mentioned before, you have a fragment of tissue, but you won't like to transplant them. And what's happening after transplantation? Um, so the, then uh, we need to also mention about the sensitivity of cells. So Cells are very sensitive when you print them in the 3D printing. So when you hear something about 3D printing, someone prints something uh, using a plastic or gel, that is quite easy. But if you put the cells to the jet to that gel with different pH, different pressure, temperature, everything, so uh, unfortunately, most of the cells can die. So this is the, for sure the challenge. Um, yeah, this is the future maybe. Uh, tissue, organ, maybe kidney, maybe heart. Limitation for sure vascularization, uh, immune rejection when you think about the allo transportation and biocompatibility that's normal. That's we think in general about the biomaterials. Okay, so to sum up, um, in my opinion, stem cells are promising tool in tissue engineering, especially adipose derived stem cells are very easily obtainable. This technology can be helpful for screening the, the potential drugs. Uh, also, in, my, in our opinion, fat tissue from ecological patients uh, can be a valid source of stem cells. And also peptides. Peptides, in my opinion, also are very promising in the future. 
Um, especially when we think about non healing wounds, especially when we think about the peptide that possess dual function. So, for example, they stimulate your generation, but also they can, for example, inhibit proliferation of bacteria, because this is the really huge challenge, because when you have a non healing wound, most of them, they are infected, actually. So even if you transplant something, the cells, which are very sensitive, it's uh, it can be uh, the effect can be very low because of the um, uh, the infection. So I would like to mention uh, our two consortia. This is uh, Regenova and Bionova, uh, people which are behind the scene uh, usually, but uh, they really they have really hard uh, working and dedicated people. Uh, this is the um, this is the Fahrenheit University. Uh, so in Gdańsk, we have three main university, and, all, and these three universities they form Fahrenheit University. So this is uh, this is our building. Uh, here is uh, our lab. This window probably is my window uh, of my office, uh, and this is the hospital, the main hospital that uh, the, there is a, a surgery department when we obtain the material. This is Bayanova um, uh, consortium that we predict, create, develop new biomaterials. Some of them, they are based using fact display technology. There was a Nobel Prize for that. And maybe that was one of the reasons that we got this uh, this project. Uh, yeah, I would like to also mention my uh, closest um, team from the Laboratory of Tissue Engineering and Related Medicine uh, from our university. Um, also, some collaborators from other universities and of course, uh, yeah, visit uh, Dice. Dice is a really beautiful city. Uh, this is one of the symbol. This is the fountain of the Neptune. They present interesting example of, of this uh, uh, classical antiquity. And also, it is uh, let's say the symbol of the connection to the sea. So it's uh, really almost the same like in the Trieste. So we have some connection uh, here. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, don't hesitate. I will. Happy to answer. Thank you.